Okay. Uh, thanks for the invitation and uh, organizing this nice workshop. Uh, so I will tell you about uh, a strongly quasi-convex pack based and bound, which is uh, a joint work with Nicholas Simon, uh, Christian Eagle, and Olivier Winterberger with, that we have presented uh, a couple of months ago at ALT. Um, so very quick summary of what I will tell you. Um, so there are two major ways to convexify classification with zero one loss. The first one is to convexify the loss and uh, the second one is to work in the space of distributions over a hypothesis space. That's the Pug Basin way and the one we are taking. And uh, what I will tell you about in this talk, so uh, we propose a relaxation of the Pug Base KL bound by Ziegler and an alternating minimization procedure for this bound. And we provide sufficient con conditions for strong quasi-convexity of the bound. And when the bound is strongly quasi-convex, this alternating min minimization is guaranteed to converge to the global minimum of the bound. Uh, then we provide uh, a special construction of a hypothesis space that works best for this bound that we have. And I will show some experiments uh, where rigorous minimization of the bound was competitive with cross-validation and tuning the trade-off between complexity and empirical performance. So we didn't do any cross-validation of the parameters. We just rigorously minimized the bound and we were able to compete with cross-validation. Uh, so I will start with very quick recap of pack based analysis. Many already talked here, so it's just to make sure we're using the same, uh, talking about the same notation. Then I will show the strongly quasi-convex pack based and bound, uh, then talk about construction of a hypothesis set for this bound and some experiments. So pack based analysis works with randomized classifiers and I will use rho to denote the distribution over a hypothesis class H and a randomized classifier at each round of the game picks a hypothesis according to this posterior distribution makes an observation X and then returns the classification H of X. Uh, and I will use this expectation with respect to rho of the loss to denote the expected loss and expectation uh, with respect to rho of the empirical loss to denote the empirical loss of this prediction rule. Okay? Uh, now this workshop is about 50 shades of Bayesian learning. I'm not sure whether somebody is counting the shades we are presenting here, uh, but I will give you one more shade and this is how I usually explain it to the students when I teach this topic in class. Uh, so when we consider classical learning and uh, classical learning we can see it as learning by selection. So if we have a hypothesis class and we have the best possible prediction rule, so when we select a hypothesis from a hypothesis class, there is an estimation error or the variance and approximation error. And uh, when we select from a small hypothesis class, then the estimation error is small, but the approximation error is large. When we select from a large hypothesis class, then the uh, approximation error becomes smaller, but the estimation error becomes larger. So selection from a larger class leads to a larger estimation error. Uh, what happens in randomized classification? So the idea is to avoid selection when it's not necessary. So when we have two hypotheses with similar empirical loss and similar prior, we take similar posterior distribution. And at this way, we, uh, we achieve reduced variance at the same bias level. So this randomization, it allows us to avoid selection when it's not necessary and to reduce bias while keeping the same uh, bias uh, level. Well, just in addition, so I'm using the big KL for the standard KL diversions and the small KL for the binary KL diversions. This was already said a lot of times today. And uh, we have the classical Bayesian theorem by uh, Matthias Ziegler, so for any prior pi over the hypothesis class and any delta in zero one with probability greater than one minus delta over a random draw of sample S, for all posterior distributions simultaneously, we have that the binary KL divergence between the 
average empirical loss and average imp uh, expected loss is bounded by this KL plus logarithm over N. So this was already in the first talk by Francois. The challenge is that this bound, it's not convex in the posterior distribution row. And a common way to tackle this problem is to replace the bound with parameterized linear trade-off and tune this parameter by cross-validation. Okay? So even though we have a nice theoretical bound, uh, most works end up replacing it with a linear trade-off and tuning this parameter by cross-validation. Uh, so I will show now something uh, different. So we propose a relaxation of the pack based KL bound, which is based on refined Pinsker's inequality. And it says that for any prior uh, distribution and any delta in zero one with probability greater than one minus delta for all posterior distributions rho and all parameters lambda in zero two simultaneously, we have this bound, okay? And um, it holds for all parameters lambda sim. So there are some forms of, like, for example, uh, Catonis bound, which is kind of similar, but it holds for one value of parameter at a time. So if we want to have it for more parameters, we have to make some additional constructions. This bound holds for all uh, values of lambda simultaneously, so we can minimize it with respect to rho and also with respect to lambda. Uh, for the optimal lambda, this bound leads to uh, this form. So we actually get so-called fast convergence rate. So when the empirical loss is small, this square root uh, term vanishes and we are in the fast convergence regime. When the empirical loss is larger, then we have the uh, slow convergence. Um, and this is, well, this is the same as like the bound in McAllister's 2003 work. So this relaxation is quite uh, tight uh, relaxation. Uh, it achieves uh, fast convergence rates if, if we want fast convergence rates. Um, now the nice point about this form of the bound, and well, we will denote by f of rho lambda the right hand side of the bound. So for a fixed lambda, this bound is convex in the posterior distribution rho. And this is quite easy to see. So the expectation is linear in rho. The Kullback library divergence is convex in rho. So if we fix lambda, this bound is convex in the posterior distribution rho. For a fixed rho, uh, this bound is actually convex in the parameter lambda, and it's minimized by this lambda. Okay, this is well, quite simple uh, test. The tricky point is that this bound is not necessarily jointly convex in rho and lambda. If it would have been jointly convex in rho and lambda, then alternating minimization uh, over rho and lambda would be guaranteed to converge to the global minimum. But joint to convexity, it's not a necessary condition. So it's a sufficient condition, but not necessary condition. And in this case, we don't necessarily have uh, the joint convexity. Uh, so we will try to see what we can we actually say uh, about this bound. And for this, we do a couple of simplifications first. Um, so this is the bound that we had, and this is the optimal uh, distribution rho given the parameter lambda. We can plug the optimal distribution into the bound, and then we get a one-dimensional function, f of lambda, which is f of this rho lambda and lambda, and, well, it's just the same function with rho lambda replacing rho. And so this is the first step in the simplif uh, simplification. Now the second step, so we have this one-dimensional function, f of lambda, that looks like that. We have the uh, posterior distribution. Uh, and now we are looking at the KL term. And the KL divergence term, we can, well, that's the expectation with respect to rho of lambda of the ratio between rho lambda and pi. The pi cancels out, so we get this expectation. And now we separate, so the denominator gives minus n lambda expectation of the empirical loss, and 
the other term gives this logarithm of expectation with respect to pi of the exponent. And if we plug this back here, then this term will cancel with this term, and we get that this one-dimensional uh, one function f of lambda can be written as this expression. Okay? And actually something similar to this you have also seen in Peter's uh, talk earlier in the morning. So this is how the function, the one-dimensional function, looks like. And now we show the condition, sufficient condition for strong uh, quasi-convexity of this function. So this is how a uh, strongly quasi-convex function looks like. Uh, it has a single global minimum. So if at least one of the two conditions are satisfied for all lambda in the relevant interval, then f of lambda is strongly quasi-convex for the relevant lambda, and the alternating minimization converges to the global minimum of f. So the conditions are that either twice the KL plus logarithm bounds n uh, lambda squared n squared times the variance, or the expectation bounds um, 1 minus lambda n times the variance. Okay? Can you tell us a bit about strong quasi It's not convex, but yeah. what is strong about it? What is the definition of it? So a strongly quasi-convex function, uh, that's, well, essentially a function with a single uh, global minimum. So it's a function where uh, ops, every level set is... Um, above the, the function. So if you connect any two points, if you connect, uh, take an interval a, b, and you look at the value of the functions on an interval a, b, the function is always below the line con connecting f of a and f of b. That's... That's, that's, that's not just what I can Huh? Ah, uh, strong quasi-convexity quasi means that you have uh, strong inequality and not so if you, if you are looking at the line uh, from uh, A to B, the function is strongly below this line and not on the line. So you don't have any plateaus in the function. Okay? Um, what? How are you doing your line? So you take, so for any pair of points A and B, yes. you take the line between F of A and F of B, and the function has to be strongly, uh, strongly below this line. But if I take, say, the minimum and the very far to the right? Yeah. Um, and it, it, should, it should be the, the level lines, not, yeah, okay, sorry. It should be the level lines that you are taking. And, and the function should be uh, strongly below the level lines. Okay? Um, so for any level line, the function is... You can't have a minimum of a function, kind of two minimums of a function between... So you have just one minimum. <laughs> it's just quasi-convexity huh? one minimum, right? Like quasi-convex, but also one minimum, that's wrong. So, so, yeah, so, so, so you don't have any plateaus in the function, and uh, for any level line, it's strictly below the, the level line. Okay? Um, Uh, so a highlight of how we prove this uh, thing. So um, what we show, we show that the second, so this is the function f of lambda, and we show that the second derivative of f of lambda is positive at all stationary points. Which means that any stationary point uh, must be minimum, and since it's a one-dimensional function, it can have only one minimum in this case. 
It's one-dimensional uh, one uh, continuous function, so it can't have more than one minimum. And, uh, well, the nice, so, so taking the second derivative of this function, so the first derivative of this logarithm is actually the expectation of the empirical loss, and the second derivative is n times the variance of this loss, so this is where the expectation and the variance are coming in. So just a slide back. So this is, again, the condition is that the variance is bounded by either the KL plus logarithm term or uh, bounded by the expectation. Um, now this, this condition, it's not very easy to verify whether it's satisfied or not when we have uh, a real problem. So we present a different sufficient condition, which is a relaxation of the previous one, and we call it weak separation sufficient condition for strong quasi-convexity. Uh, and I will first explain it with a picture. So uh, we consider the loss of the optimal hypothesis in the hypothesis class. And the theorem says that um, there is a critical interval uh, drawn here in red. And uh, we more or less can have any number of good hypotheses, the hypotheses that are close to the optimal one, and we have more or less any number of bad hypotheses. The bad hypotheses are those which are sufficiently far from the optimum. And the key thing is to have relatively few hypotheses in this red region, which is neither very good nor very bad, but somewhere in between. And a bit more precisely, so uh, if we have a finite hypothesis uh, space, and a uniform uh, distribution, uh, uniform prior distribution over the hypothesis space and for certain values of these parameters A and B. So if the number of hypotheses for which the empirical loss falls in this red interval is at most logarithmic in N over delta squared, then F of lambda is strongly quasi-convex and alternating minimization converges to the global minimum of the function. Okay. Um, so, again, some highlights of the proof of this result. Uh, so, by the strong quasi-convexity theorem, uh, if the variance is small and small, well, bounded by the two terms that we had earlier, then f of lambda is strongly quasi-convex. We look at the suboptimality gap of different hypotheses, so this delta H, and the variance can be bounded by expectation of the squares of the gaps, which is uh, the weighted average of the squares of, uh, of the gaps. And this uh, posterior distribution, that's a Gibbs distribution that depends on the suboptimality of the hypothesis. So when we are close to the optimal hypothesis, the gap is small, so the contribution to the variance is small. When we are far from the best hypothesis, then the exponent is small, so again, the contribution to the variance is small. And uh, the critical contribution comes from this red se segment where the, the gap is not too small and not too large. So we want the number of hypotheses that are in this red region to be relatively small. And that's, that's how we get it. Again, I can go back a couple of slides to this first theorem. So what we essentially show is that this lambda squared n squared times the variance is bounded by the logarithm of n over delta squared. Uh, and we can actually ignore this KL term because it's always positive, so it only helps us to get uh, even better bound. like binary search on the lambda, um, could also be possible, yeah. Um, okay, uh, now I've shown sufficient conditions for quasi-convexity of this function. It's actually possible to break the quasi-convexity, so it's possible to construct an example where f of lambda is not quasi-convex, but uh, kind of one has to work hard for it. So here is one example. So if we take 
200 samples, delta equals 0 0.25, and we take exponentially many hypotheses, so 2 million hypotheses with suboptimality uh, sub gap of 0 0.1 and a uniform prior, then we will get a function that's not qu uh, strongly quasi-convex. Uh, but we have to take really a lot of hypotheses in order to break the quasi-convexity. And uh, in all our experiments, uh, f of lambda was actually even convex, not just quasi-convex, but even uh, convex, uh, even in the situations where the weak separation condition was uh, violated. So it may be possible to relax the sufficient condition uh, even further. Uh, so now the construction of a hypothesis set that we are working with. So the challenge is that the computation of the normalization factor in uh, this posterior distribution can be computationally uh, expensive. And if we do parameterization of the posterior distribution, that may break the convexity of the bound in the posterior distribution. So what we do instead, we work with finite hypothesis uh, space. And for a finite hypothesis space, we can compute uh, the partition function. But the point is that we need a powerful finite hypothesis space. Uh, so the next critical point is how to construct a powerful but finite hypothesis space. Uh, so what we do, we construct a sample dependent hypothesis space where we take uh, subsamples of size R. Uh, so we take M subsamples of size R uh, each and we train uh, models on, so M models, each model is trained on R points and validated on the remaining N minus R points. And we'll look at the validation loss uh, on the remaining points uh, and we adapt the bound so that the bound depends on the validation loss and then there is the, cor uh, the correction for the sample size that was used for estimating the validation loss. Um, so this construction slightly resembles um, um, sample compression but unlike in general approaches to sample compression where all possible subsamples are considered, we only consider M uh, subsamples which can be selected randomly or they can also be selected deterministically. The main point is that uh, these points should be subsampled independently of the compo uh, composition of the data set. And a special case of this construction is k-fold cross-validation. So when we do k-fold cross-validation, we actually select, um, we train a model on k minus one uh, parts of the data and validate it on the remaining part. But in our case, most computational advantage w is achieved by inverse cross-validation. So we actually take small subsamples for training and large subsamples for validation. Okay. Uh, so now to the experiments uh, that we have. So we compare uh, kernel SVM trained by cross-validation to row weighting of multiple weak uh, SVMs trained on D plus one samples where D plus one is the dimensionality of the data. A bit more precisely, we apply row weighted aggregation of this weak classifier. So we take a look at the majority vote of the classifiers weighted according to row. But in our case, there was no significant difference between the majority vote and um, the Gibbs uh, prediction rule, so you can see kind of both when you look at the graphs. Uh, a rough runtime comparison, so if we do uh, k-fold cross-validation on kernel support vector machines, we have, so kernel support vector machines have super quadratic training time, so the training time is of order n to the power of more than square, and then validation is relatively cheap, so overall the time for running kernel uh, cross-validation on kernel SVMs is k to the n to the power of more than two. Uh, in our approach, uh, the training is actually the easy part because we are working with small subsamples, but uh, the validation of the errors is the expensive uh, part. 
And um, uh, then if we take subsamples of size d plus 1 and we take m, which is of order n of such subsamples, then we get complexity, which is of order roughly d times n squared. So we get an improvement in the power uh, of n, which leads to a computational speed up. And this is how it looks uh, in the graphs. So uh, what we have here, so the red line, that's the performance of cross-validated uh, kernel SVM. The black line, that's the performance of uh, our method as we increase uh, the number of uh, hypotheses, the, the number of those um, uh, weak classifiers trained on small subsamples. And as we reach uh, m equals n, in most cases we get uh, close to the performance of cross-validated uh, SVM. Now the dashed red line, that's the, uh, the time, the training time of cross-validated um, support vector machine. And the black dashed line, that's the time for training our method. So we, we achieve comparable results at much smaller uh, computational cost. And then the blue line, that's the pack basin bound on the prediction error of, um, uh, of the Gibbs classifier. And you can see that in all the cases, it's quite tight bound on the performance. OK? Uh, now to the summary. So uh, we propose the relaxation of the pack based KL bound and an alternating minimization procedure for the bound. Uh, we have provided sufficient conditions for strong quasi-convexity of this uh, function, which guarantee convergence to the global minimum. We have proposed construction of a hypothesis space. And in our experiments, rigorous minimization of the bound was competitive with cross-validation and tuning the trade-off between complexity and empirical performance. Okay? So let me emphasize this one more time. So rigorous minimization of a theoretical bound was competitive with cross-validation. Okay, uh, what's next? So some ideas, what could be done next? So first direction is to improve the sufficient conditions uh, for strong quasi-convexity. So in, again, in practice, our bound was strongly uh, convex even when the weak separation sufficient condition was violated. And this suggests that we can probably relax the sufficient conditions so when we did the analysis, we dropped some terms from the uh, strong quasi-convexity theorem uh, when we made the weak separation condition. So again, to remind you, uh, we have bounded the variance j just by this logarithmic term. We dropped the KL term. So if we take back the KL term or if we look at the second condition, it may be possible to get um, weaker sufficient conditions. And uh, another direction is to do improved analysis of the weighted majority vote and probably combine the results with improved analysis of uh, the weighted majority vote, the C-bound that uh, Francois has mentioned uh, today morning. And here are some works on this C-bound that um, they have. So thanks for your attention. question. So I actually yeah, didn't get to the details of selecting parameters in SVM. So uh, what we did for the cross-validated SVM, we did cross-validation over the, uh, the width and the trade-off parameter. For our method, we have, um, so since we had 
so few points it was possible to achieve perfect separation so we didn't have uh, to, to do anything with tuning of the trade-off between the margin and um, the empirical error and uh, for the width of the bandwidth of this um, uh, kernel we, we have just thrown in all the same values that were used in the cross-validated SVM which created a kind of larger base hypothesis space and we have put all this hypothesis space into our procedure. So our procedure did complete uh, model selection, in including the bandwidth of the kernel. It's bound. It's so, yeah. It, it's bound on the Gibbs rigs, but again, the the black lines are also like it's the same whether it, almost the same whether I take majority vote or the Gibbs prediction. In this case, yes. Is your Gibbs in that case becomes almost deterministic? Uh, no, no, not not. Uh, so we had experiments on eight different data sets, and for. For most of them, it was uh, more than one hypothesis that was participating in, in Gibbs. Not too many, but an order of 10 hypotheses uh, for which the prior was not too small. <laughs> 